much. That was really great for I think what we're about to talk about this morning, embracing wholeness. Because that wholeness is individual to each one of us. There's different things that are needed to make us whole. In the Quran, it says that we are completed, we were created complete, yet incomplete. But what makes us incomplete has to do with our experiences in this human body. But of course, we are perfect because we are spirit, we are one with God. But I want to start with a story. And that story will help to illustrate this concept of embracing oneness, embracing wholeness. So after a number of years, a truth seeker who was going all around the known world at that time, and you get to, in your mind, your imagination, determine what the seeker looks like, where the seeker is in the world, you get to fill that, up, fill that out yourself. But this seeker had traveled all over the known world looking for what is true. And finally, he came across a wise woman who told him that the truth was in a well in a cave. So he's very excited, and he goes to this mystical cave, and he goes to the well, and he petitions the well for the idea or for the answer to what is true. And the well tells him to go to the village and go to the crossroads in that village. We all know what crossroads are, right? And if you think of a small town with one stoplight, you have an idea of what this area or what this village may look like. And when he got there, he wasn't very excited because all he saw were three stores. Nothing really happening in the village. One store just sold metal. Another store sold wood. And the final store just sold little trinkets and pieces of metal wire. It's like there's nothing here. So he's angry. He searched the whole world and he thought he had the answer. So he goes back to this mystical well. I went where you sent me, but I didn't find anything there. And the well told him that everything that he needed was there. So, of course, he's still disappointed. He leaves and continues his journey to search. And many years pass. And this person has life experiences, begin to grow. Slowly by slowly, this person stopped focusing so much on where they have been in their journey or where they're going in the future, but started to be more present about what was happening in the seeker's life at that moment the relationships that he has built, have built and maintained over that time. And one day he was walking through that village which he had now made his home. And he began to hear this lovely music from a sitar. Anyone familiar with the sitar? I know the musicians are. Right? It's like the ancient form of a guitar. Right? And so they're sitting there, kind of, kind of, yeah, it's a string instrument. So he hears this lovely music. It has been masterfully played. And he sits and he listens to the music and it's just inspiring him, it's moving him, it's moving something deep within his soul. And then it dawned on him that that instrument that was made of pieces of metal and wood and the metal strings, when brought together it produced a sound, it produced an experience for him in his life that inspired him. And he began to understand that the well did send him to the right place. That he had everything that he needed, he simply needed to bring it together in his experience. So our task is to take what we have in our life, what is made available to us, and to assemble it so that we can find that which will make us whole. But I'd like to take this idea or this story of the well, and I wanted to, I would like to first dive into it a little bit. I believe that, 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 that it could teach us three things that, are going, that is going to help us truly embrace the idea of wholeness. So number one, let's dissect the story a little bit and dive into it. Two, 
why don't we also listen to ourselves to see what comes up for us personally in that story as we explore it? And then finally, let's make some firm decisions for ourselves. Maybe not today, maybe not next week, but we make a firm decision for ourselves and that will become more clear as we go through this. The first thing I'd like for us to do in dissecting this story is to look at where he went. That well was in pain. Now that is symbolic because it represents a place where you go to commune with God. A silent, quiet place. Going into the silence. As a matter of fact, in Islamic history, Prophet Muhammad started his entire journey because he says that he was visited by an angel, the angel Gabriel, when he was meditating in a cave. All of these holy books are really representations of our human experience, representations of our spiritual psychology. The well itself in the story represents the universal mind, the God consciousness that is inside each and one of us. It represents the inspiration that flows throughout our, through our consciousness, that flows from us peacefully and easily. And much like a well, when we meditate, when we sit into the silence, we receive revitalization. We receive a renewing. Just like the water from a well can be used to give to our crops if we were farmers or to our animals if we were in husbandry, that same water or spiritual nourishment can take us and renew us as well and sustain us. In the Bible, in the book of Numbers, there's actually a story about Moses getting water from a rock. Now, I know when we were growing up and uh, we were asking our parents for money, they would tell us, well, you can't get, you know, blood from a rock or, you know, you can't squeeze anything out of a turnip or whatever uh, 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 euphemism they used to use for money, right? But in this story, we actually see, see it happen. And if you're not familiar with the story, Moses was wandering through the desert with the Israelites, and everyone was thirsty. They ran out of water. And so they needed some water. They needed water for the animals, for the children, for everyone. And so he was commanded to strike a rock twice, and water would spring forth from it. Now, I'm pretty sure if I go outside and I strike a rock, there's no water coming out of it. So I want us to keep in mind that everything in the Bible is a spiritual story that represents what's happening in the mind of human beings. They're all, all the people, all the places in the story, in the Bible, excuse me, represent our thoughts. And so striking, so that rock itself, excuse me, represents our reliance on the physical world. That's what that rock means. It's when we only rely on our intellect, only the things that we have learned, the things we've learned from our environment, from our parents, from what is around us, outside of us what we have learned from our circumstances in life. But Moses struck that rock twice and water came forth abundantly. That means that we need to break through this false outer world. We need to break through only relying on our internet, intellect, but instead to rely on that which is deep within us, that which is eternal within us. Now it also says that Moses struck the rock twice. They, 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 they made sure to mention that he hit it twice. That has to do with the concept of repetition. So when we want something and we desire a certain circumstance in our lives, it's not enough that we study the word once or every now and then. It's not enough that we meditate every now and then. It's not enough that we pray just when things are going to get tough, you know, and you really need it at that point. And we start pleading to God. But instead, we are rep we execute. Uh, this on a repeated basis. We utilize repetition. We make it a natural part of how we exist. We continually med meditate. We continually abide in the word so that we can have those, uh, we can nurture our souls, nurture ourselves, and have that uh, well or that water or inspiration continually flow to us. Also in the story, the seeker was sent to crossroads. And we mentioned that a moment ago, though. And we've all been at crossroads. Maybe we've all taken cross-country trips. Anyone done that and went through some small towns? There's some of them here in uh, Virginia where you would go through a small town and there's one stoplight 
right? And all the major stores are around that stoplight, and it's pretty quaint when you see that, right? It's kind of quaint, it's kind of nice. And when you get to that crossroad, when you're driving, you have four options, right? You can go straight ahead, you can make a left, you can make a right, or you can turn around and go back the way you came. And those crossroads in this story, they represent that we need to make conscious decisions. If we want to embrace our wholeness, it begins by making a conscious decision to do exactly that. Without having a conscious decision, then where are we directing our energy? Oftentimes, we would direct our energy or scatter it in many different ways, many different places. But when we focus it and we make a decision, when we're at that crossroad in our life, that is going to enable us to move forward. And when I talk about making a decision, you're making a decision regarding, regarding what is your truth. The truth as you see it and the truth as you know it. And I make that distinction about your truth from the truth. Now, because there's a lot of faiths out there, and I don't disparage any of them, that talk about the truth. And when they talk about the truth, they're talking about an ado a doctrine. Some doctrine where scholars put together. I don't care if we're talking about uh, Shia Islam, or we're talking about Baptists, or we're talking about Reformed Jews, or Buddhists from India versus Buddhists from uh, Eastern Asia. There are all doctrines, and all of them have the truth, or some version of the truth. But ultimately, what's more important to us? The doctrine that the few scholars got together, granted they're wise, or the truth that God has revealed directly to you. That is your gift. That is your truth. And oftentimes we deny that truth because that truth is our gift. Sometimes we're embarrassed to share it. We don't believe in ourselves, so we won't go after it. But in any case, we are denying or not making a decision based on the truth that has been revealed to us. Your truth is what God has directly communicated to you. So how can we embrace wholeness if we're not actually embracing our truth, who we really are? When we're at a crossroads, we're there to make a decision. And making a decision is our first step in becoming a congruent human, becoming whole. Embracing ourselves whole. I have a question for everyone. How do we know that we are at a crossroads in life? I'm going to make a suggestion, and that suggestion will be that when we are uncomfortable with our comfort, You look at your life, and it might be great. You have everything that you need. You got a nice home, wonderful relationship. Maybe you like your job or your business. Maybe you're comfortably retired, whatever the case may be. But you feel a discomfort about some aspect of your life. You are at a crossroads. You are being called to something. And you know what? Maybe you've accepted your truth in your life, and you've done things already. And they were wonderful, but God ain't done with you yet. The party ain't over until the party's over. God will call you to do more. Call you to a new level of truth. So when we are feeling frustrated, or we pay attention to our emotions, we will know that we are being called to greater. The, way, the seeker found three different shops. And those three different shops had metal, wood, and then thin pieces of metal. That metal shop represents, or metal rather, represents that Christ consciousness within us. It it, I, I say it represents that because like metal, it's something that's resilient, but we can form it into different shapes. The ancient folks used to take metal and they made swords out of it to protect themselves and other tools they needed. And today we use metals to hold up these big structures, these buildings. We use metals in order to build our cars, and we rely upon these things. 
So this represents God within us because that is what we, and the only thing that we truly have to rely on in this life. The second store had solid wood. And solid wood represents something that you can fashion. If we take a look at a wood chair or a table, anyone here do woodworking? Anyone do woodworking? A little bit of woodworking? Last time I, a little, little bit? Okay. Last time I did that, I honestly was in middle school. We had an industrial arts class. That was the last time, first and last time I did any woodwork. But it was fun. It was fun because they gave me a set of instructions on how to build, I believe it was a little game. And they gave us a set of instructions on how to build it and taught us how to use the equipment safely. And then we followed those instructions. We didn't deviate from the instructions. We made a decision that that is what we're going to build. And then we fashioned the wood according to those instructions into the thing that we wanted to build. That represents our purpose. It represents our desire in life. It represents that decision point that we discussed a moment ago. And then finally, the third store had thin pieces of metal that form the strings of the sitar. This represents our feelings and our emotions. And what we must have are strong feelings toward our desire. If we do not have that feeling, that energy behind it, it is impossible for that thing to come to pass. It must be powered by our emotions. Everyone, anyone ever heard the term striking a chord? Right? It means someone said something or did something and it really resonated with us. Dan plays the bass as he is playing the bass and he is literally striking chords, right? He can feel the vibrations from the instrument and not only can we hear that music, but we can feel the music, right? You can feel music. You ever had someone drive past you and they're, they're blaring the music real loud and you can feel the music? We can feel music. But beyond just feeling it from, you know, the sound waves, think about how the music makes you feel. As a matter of fact, someone tell me a song they love. Anyone? I know you guys love That's a song you love. What the fuck is my head? The way he makes me feel. The way he makes me feel. That's a right? That's Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand, okay. And when you think of the songs that you love, doesn't it generate certain feelings for you? When you think about a song, I'm thinking about Matter of fact, I want everyone to pick a song. Pick a song in your mind. And just think for a moment about that song that you love, and I know you have many of them. But think about how that song makes you feel on the inside. Think about how it can change your mood when you hear those songs. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna think of, I'm gonna share one song with you. Imagine by John Lennon. It's a powerful song. It's a beautiful song. And what's incredible about that song is that it was written in 1971 and there were young people out there in their 20s listening to Imagine by John Lennon and their parents weren't born yet when the song came out. That song has longevity because it resonates with something in human nature. The song is powerful because it moves our emotions in a certain way. And that's what the strings represent in that song. That is how powerful our emotions are. We have seen people become so fearful of things. You might, have been, you might know these people in your personal life. They're so scared of something happening and then that thing happens. Or someone who is so optimistic all the time. You've met that person too, right? Equally as well. <laughs> But you gotta love them because they're just so positive all the time and all good things keep happening to this person. And when something bad happens to them, what do they do? Oh man, that was terrible. Well, you know what? One door closes, another one opens, and then they just keep on going, right? They are able to take and control their feelings and whatever they're focused on, they're able to accomplish because they have that powerful force or feeling behind it. I think of some songs like as I was driving in, I was listening to one song this morning, God's Grace. It's an R&B uh, gospel song. And it resonated with me. Something that I want to listen to before I get up and speak or talk about the word of God. In 1989,
Public Enemy had a song called Fight the Power. And it was a politically motivated song. It got me reading books and things of that nature. It stirred something in me. Uh, there was a song called Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Everyone familiar with that song? Now, I remember being in Thailand one time with uh, some folks I went to grad school with. And we were finishing up a project. And we went to a restaurant. And the song came on. And there was a bunch of people there. Most of them did not speak English. We knew every single word to the song Don't Stop Believing. That's powerful. So music can really resonate with us. And the strings of the sitar really represent how powerful our feelings are and how much of, a, of an ingredient it is in helping us embrace our wholeness, embrace who we truly are. We as human beings have every single thing that we need in order to live whole and complete lives. We have every single thing within us at our disposal right now to feel secure, to be secure. But unfortunately, we get distracted by our past. We're too distracted by what happened 10 minutes ago, what happened 10 years ago, what happened 30 years ago, what happened a week ago, or the drive-in. We get distracted by things that are dead and gone. Sometimes we get distracted by the future. Where will I be in five years? Where will I be next week? How is this going to work out? Focusing so much on the future, but like the seeker, the seeker decided to focus on the present, to enjoy the relationships and the people and what he had in his life in front of him. He learned to begin putting those pieces together. And when the truth, the truth seeker was there listening to that music by the sitar, he became stirred in his emotions by that music, and he understood how that instrument was put together, he needed to, again, in his life, put together all of the components that he needed to be or needed to embrace his wholeness. So in the same way, it requires that we bring together those aspects into our own consciousness. I'm going to share with you one last item that I think is of relevant importance concerning embracing wholeness. And I'm going to use the Bible again, and I keep going back to it, only because most people who may be listening to this online are familiar with it. But this book called Bible is in a history book. It is a book that describes the thinking of the human being. Every person, every place, everything in the Bible is all about you and me. It's all about how we Every mountain in the Bible represents our high state of consciousness. Every valley it talks about represents our low state of consciousness. The water talks about the wisdom that we encounter. The stories and the people in the Bible are our situations and how we think and how we can apply it to make our lives better. Every story describes an aspect of our thinking and our spiritual psychology. And at the very beginning of the Bible, there is this statement. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. It sounds like he's actually creating and building stuff. But I think there's a deeper meaning there. When it talks about let us make man, this is talking about manifestation. Let us make man means that we are creators of our own reality. Let us make man means that we must believe and know that we are one with God and that good flows to us with no effort on our part, with no qualification in that we have God's grace. In our image after our likeness means after like thought. Meaning the thoughts that we have within our conscious mind, those thoughts are then made available to that universal consciousness. So that decision that we make, that decision that we're going to be whole as human beings, that decision is what we make available to our conscious mind and then it's made available or excuse me, manifest by the universal mind. So when we embrace our truest desire, the first thing that we need to do is to decide exactly what that is. And then let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
these creatures that are described in the Bible are also representations of something. It's representations of our emotions. The fish are our profound feelings that are associated with spiritual wisdom. You see the little fish on the back of people's vehicles, right? That is a sign that has to do with wisdom. The fowl of the air are our lofty emotions and our happy feelings. The cattle are our base emotions and our feelings when we allow the outside world to shake our faith. And those creeping things, those insects upon the earth, those are our lowly emotions that can drag us down. So we have the ability to not only have faith in God, we also have the ability to make a decision within our lives, a decision to embrace who we truly are, and we have dominion over our emotions to make that a reality. So in conclusion, our charge is to do this spiritual work. We are to cultivate this perception of oneness through our prayers and our meditation, to exercise dominion by living mindfully, and to look at our expectations in life and understand what we are truly seeking. And so is the lesson. And so it is.